All right, we'll go ahead and get started here with the next uh, presenter on our Ceph Day track at Open Source Days here. Thank you everybody for making it. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Rob from Mellanox. He's going to talk about uh, Ceph performance across high speed networks. So, Rob? Thank you very much. Okay. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay? Awesome. All right, so I'm going to talk about how to improve the performance of Ceph um, using high performance networks and protocols. I'm going to focus on four areas. First of all, just the wires, making the network faster. Secondly, the architecture, architecting the network to be you know, faster, to be able to utilize the faster wires. Thirdly, flash storage and how to get the most performance out of flash in Ceph on a network. And finally, a new protocol, well, not a new protocol, but a new protocol to Ceph called RDMA, or Remote um, Direct Memory Access. A uh, quick um, bit about the company I'm from, Mellanox. Uh, we build end-to-end -end Ethernet and InfiniBand high-performance solutions, so 1 to 100 gigabit Ethernet and all the different InfiniBand speeds. Um, by end-to-end, -end, I mean we build the adapters and the silicon that go into the servers and the storage systems and the appliances and the switches that are in the middle and the cables that connect them all up. And we provide software drivers to hook them into the operating systems and the different applications. Um, we're pretty good at it. So uh, last year we owned, um, or we had, according to the analysts, um, more than 85% of the market for Ethernet uh, adapters over 10 gigabits. And that's the part of the market that's projected in the next three years to grow to be even bigger than 10 gig. So that's the, you know, where all the growth is. So we know a little bit about high performance uh, networking. So I'm going to start off with the wires. Um, so this is some testing we've done. And there's actually a, a white paper on our website on exactly how, how we did it and all the configurations. And I think they're actually handing out um, these white papers or some flyers for it at our booth uh, over in the marketplace, if you want to stop by there. Um, but what we did was we tested uh, starting with 1 gig all the way up to 40 gig. Uh, and you can see, of course, some major results uh, in differences between uh, 1 and 10 gig. But even going from 10 to 40 gig, um, you know, two, more than 2x the performance uh, on bandwidth and 15% higher IOPS. So if we look at some of the new network speeds, the 2550 gigabit compared to 10 gig, we see um, uh, the results there are just as dramatic. So even going from 10 to 25 gig, you get almost 100% improvement in bandwidth and 100% improvement in IOPS. Now 25 gig is um, uh, really av widely available now. Um, it's um, um, it's kind of what they, what are they, I think there's a saying now, uh, 25 is the new 10. In fact, Cisco switches now, 10 gig switches, 10, 25, it's the same, the same switch, and they don't charge a premium for it as well. And the adapter prices at 25 gig are very, very close, if not the same, as 10 gig. So it's not a break the bank thing, and much easier than putting two 10 gigs in. If you do an internet search um, of um, recommendations from different vendors, uh, of Ceph or, or uh, VARs putting Ceph together. What you find is most of them on average are, are saying you want a 10 gig NIC for every 15 hard drives in an OSD. So um, 25 gig is a, is a great solution for, for a lot of hard drives. And this, uh, these high performance networks are available today. So multiple vendors, it's not only my company. Um, I, I know at 25 gig alone, there's at least four other vendors providing products today. And you're going to have a higher speed um, networking um, starting later this year. We'll be introducing two and 400 gigabit uh, Ethernet solutions. So with these faster wires, we need to also look at the architecture of the network. Um, in Ceph, there's two logical networks that can actually be two physical networks, the, the public network uh, or where the clients are connected and the cluster network uh, that just connects the OSDs. 
And there's a lot of performance that happens between the OSDs or a performance needed between the OSDs because there's a lot of traffic there um, for basically the, the replication and uh, recovery and rebalancing as well as the heartbeat, you know, making sure that the, the different the OSDs are all up and running. In fact, if you look at the, the gains you get by separating those networks, by making that physical, uh, those two logical networks uh, physically separated, you can see that if you've got um, 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, on a single network with no cluster network, that you're using uh, over 50% of it just for the OSDs. If you separate them and put in a faster network like 40 gig, you can see that you get a much um, a, a huge boost in your overall networking capabilities. And you free up that private side network for reads and writes to the OSDs from the clients. There's a lot of traffic on that cluster network I talked about for replication and erasure coding, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. So for, from a, for a read operation, pretty simple. The client goes to the OSD, reads the data. But if you look at what happens on a write, so there's no extra cluster traffic in this in scenario. But if you look at a write, you get you know, two more writes that occur, assuming you're doing a, a three replication um, on that cluster network. Or if you have it all on one network, you're actually, for every write, tripling the amount of data that crosses the network. So by segmenting it, you're going to see an improvement on the client side in a loaded system. And if you look at the recovery from a replication, you see um, a, a large impact. So, for example, here's some different uh, network speeds and the time it takes to recover from an OSD loss, a uh, 2 terabit size, a 20 terabit, and a 200 terabit size OSD. You can see with 10 gigabits, um, it's going to take you half an hour if you lose an o I'm sorry, with, with 10 gigabit Ethernet and 2 terabytes, it's going to take you half an hour to recover from a lost OSD. And that's full bandwidth. So that entire 10 gigabits is being used to get it to that time. If you've got other traffic, like you haven't segmented the network, then it's going to take a lot longer. And remember, that time is risk, right? Because if you lose two more OSDs or if you're only using a two re replication, that time is a risk that if you lose another one, you're going to have a data loss. You can see that if you've got a 200 terabyte OSD, it's going to take you almost two days on a 10 gigabit cluster network, private cluster network, doing nothing than that to, to back up that data, but you go or to recover from that. But if you go to 25 gig, just 25 gig, it's going to drop it to under a day, and you can get it in you know just a few hours with 100 gig. So you really want to fence off that client network from that cluster network, and. Um, that's going to give you a, a lot of performance and a lot more reliability. So the easiest way to do that, if you look at a typical network architecture where you've got the core and the distribution and the access point, usually the core is at a higher speed. Um, nowadays, probably mostly 40 gig with 10 gig to the, to the clients. You can simply add a switch in the rack where the OSDs are and now your OSDs are on, on, a, on a cluster network, independent of the, of the client network. And you also now easily can change the speed of that cluster network because it's not part of the overall network infrastructure and it's not going to cause bottlenecks higher up in the core to distribution layers. And it's not very expensive. Uh, this is a little half-wide 1U switch that uh, we sell, but there's multiple vendors of switches at these speeds as well. But this, this product, um, uh, it's 40 gig. 40 gig, this product would cost you for 16 ports just over $5,000. So $5,000 to decrease your recovery time huge and improve the overall reliability. And if you wanted to put in 100 gig, you could do it for under $10,000. Let's uh, now look at erasure coding. Um, so in this case, instead of making copies, we're using a special algorithm to, that can take the data and break it up into small pieces across multiple OSDs. And the advantage here is instead of needing 3x the storage, you only need one and a half times the storage. 
but there's a payment for it, and another reason to have that separate cluster network is that there's a lot more traffic that goes on, small message traffic, as the shards are called, those little pieces that are broken up by this formula and distributed across, across the different OSDs are, are sent out. So it's less than the traffic that you would see with replication if you're using three replications, because it's only 50% more than that one write but there's still more traffic and a lot of, of small traffic, so latency is important. Um, the read operation, though, is the other way, because in a read operation with just replication, you're only asking for the read from the client and you're getting back the data. But here, you've got to decode that data that's spread across the different OSDs, so it's gonna create more traffic on that, that cluster part of the network. Good reason to have it independent. <clears throat> And I don't have a slide for it um, because it's rather complicated, but you also, um, when you have an error here and you have to recover, think about the recovery mechanism and the traffic. So you not only have to decode the, the data from the OSDs that remain, but then you have to re-encode it across the OSD to the, to the replacement OSD. Or if there's less OSDs, you have to re-do um, the calculation. So that can be very heavy traffic on, on the cluster network as well. The other downside to using um, erasure coding is that it's a very, very heavy load on the CPU, because the CPU has to do that calculation. It's a very complicated calculation um, on all the data in order to in, in, um, put it into the format needed for, for erasure coding. One way to get around that is uh, uh, NICs, uh, RNICs, that um, uh, have offload engines for erasure coding. Uh, and the way this works, at least with our solution, is when the data is sent to the adapter, the, the Ethernet adapter, it actually does the calculation in hardware and distributes the data across the nodes, thereby offloading the um, CPU um, from those calculations. And everybody knows that Ceph loves, loves to use CPUs, so it's a good thing. Does Ceph support that acceleration? So here's um, what we're, how we're, um, going to implement it. There's a module in Ceph that does the erasure coding, and what we're doing, and it's in development right now, is we're creating a replacement for that module that simply uses this offload. So it's just a matter of switching that module. By the way, if anybody else has questions, don't hesitate to interrupt. I should have said that earlier. So the next area I want to talk about is Flash. Um, I think everybody realizes that flash storage is, or SSDs are becoming um, super uh, popular across data centers. In fact, many data centers are going all flash because it solves the problem, uh, believe it or not, of reliability because disk drives have all these moving parts. And although flash was initially supposed to time out and have all these problems, it isn't turned out to be that way because of the software uh, or the load balancing and all the special software on flash that distributes the load across all the NAND chips. And so many data centers are just saying, hey, I'm going all flash because the maintenance is on my hard drives is um, very expensive. And secondly, they're doing it because you don't have to worry about matching up the storage to the performance of the applications anymore because all your storage is fast. So anyway, Flash is becoming super popular. But that comes with a price, right? Because it puts a big load on the network, and here's why. Because the change, um, first of all, the, the um, y-axis on this chart is logarithmic, but the change in performance just between hard drives and SSDs is 100 times. That's huge. And the change between <laughs> hard drive or SSDs in the new persistent memory that's going to come out over the next five years is another 100 times. So there's a 10,000 times improvement happening in storage in a 10-year period. To understand the magnitude of that, think about how far it is from here to St. Louis. Google says it's about 1,000 miles in 18 hours. Now think about, hopefully a lot of you are from Boston, think about the distance from here to Boston College. It's roughly 10 miles. 15 minutes, according to Google, versus 18 hours. That's the magnitude and difference in performance just between hard drives and SSDs. If you add the persistent memory in here, that's like 1,500 feet. So 15 minutes to Boston College, or how long does it take you to walk 1,500 feet? So this is putting a huge change or load on different components uh, in 
the whole ecosystem, especially the storage side or the networking side. And here's why. So if you look at this, this chart uh, shows how many hard drives it takes to fill a 10 gig, which is the red line, and then a 40 gig, which is the yellow line, and then uh, the blue line is 100 gig. How many hard drives it takes to fill those wires? And you can see almost 25 drives it takes to fill a 10 gig link, and you know hundreds to fill the other, the other wires. If I just switch that serial ATA interface to a hard to a SSD interface, so go from a hard drive to NAND, now it's just two. And four or almost ten or nine will almost fill a 40 gig link. Now there's a new technology for SSDs called NVMe, and this was a redesign of the interface to SSDs because they initially came out with the legacy hard drive interfaces which were slowing them down. If you switch to NVMe drives, one of them overflows 10 gig, two of them overflow 40 gig, and ten of, or four of them almost fill a 100 gig link. So if you're buying SSDs for their performance and you're not upgrading your network, you're you know, wasting some of your money. You're getting performance locally, but if you're remoting that storage, you're wasting your money. You're not getting the full value of that, of that high performance SSD. So this is some testing that's been done by many companies. Um, it was a, it's a little bit old, so it's a couple years ago. Um, and they did testing uh, on Ceph systems with disks, changing the disks, changing the SSDs, the networks, the CPUs, the operating systems. Um, and you can access this on, on the internet or you can uh, go to our booth and they can show you how to get to it. Um, and what you can see is the, the difference that just adding some uh, SSDs uh, provides to the performance if you also improve the performance of the network. So you can see on the, the far one here, if I can get the pointer to work, uh, in this one you had a mixture of SSDs and NVMe, and then here, taking the hard drives out, you increase the performance just using the NVMe SSDs. And then you can see if you add a lot of flash, the more flash you add, the faster the performance you get. So it's important to improve or to increase the performance of your network if you're using SSDs. Here's um, uh, some data from um, Quanta uh, on the same area. Here in, the, in, their demonstra or in their test facility, they were able to show uh, almost a seven times improvement in performance by using a faster network with an SSD implementation. Here's some more data with, from multiple different um, um, vendors. And you can see different speeds of the network and the performance they got and different numbers of SSDs. These are all straight full SSD implementations of Ceph. The last subject I'm going to talk about for improving the performance is a new, is a technology called RDMA or a protocol called RDMA. So we've talked about how to improve the performance by having faster wires and re-architecting the infrastructure of the network and how to take advantage of the SSD performance. But now we're going to talk about a new protocol or a change at the protocol running on those wires. And this isn't an old technology. It's been in the market for many years, but in the HPC world, the world of supercomputers. It started out about 20 years ago almost now, and it's now uh, it's embedded in InfiniBand technology and it, the protocol that runs over InfiniBand wires, and it's uh, now a dominant part of the HPC market. In fact, if you look at the top 500 supercomputers in the world, you can see it's the uh, navy blue line. It's the dominant interconnect between those supercomputers. Supercomputers these days aren't the, the big circular craze that they were when we were kids. They're now a cluster of PCs or RISC um, processors all connected together with a very, very fast low latency network. And the protocol those networks run is RDMA. If we look at the regular straight storage market um, and look at the three different areas, object, block, and file, as we talked about, you can improve the performance of those with these, you know, these are common protocols for those different um, areas um, just by flash or, or high bandwidth Ethernet. But also, you can use RDMA technology, and it's been used in the Ethernet world for many years um, 
just over, in, over Ethernet in a technology called Rocky or RDMA over converged Ethernet, but in the segments that needed high performance. So for example, if you think of block, there's a technology called iSCSI or a protocol called iSCSI for networking block storage. And there's a version of it called ICER that is iSCSI over RDMA. If you think about um, file, uh, Microsoft has a technology called SIFS or SMB now, I think is the new name for it. And there's a version of it called SMB Direct, which works over RDMA for higher performance. NFS over RDMA is for the NFS file system or file protocol. And then on object, the technology we're going to talk about is Ceph over RDMA. Now, I said it was a niche for high performance, but that niche is becoming mainstream because that very high performance uh, SSD interface called NVMe that I talked about a few minutes ago is now being put into a protocol called NVMe over Fabric so that it can be transmitted across a network. And that standard came out, uh, boy, over uh, almost a year ago now. And it includes a, what's called a binding layer in the standard for transport over RDMA. And the new memory technologies, the new persistent memory technologies that are again 100 times faster than SSDs are there's work underway for the last year and a half on how to put that across a network and all of that is focused around RDMA protocol. So because of that, this, this RDMA technology is going to become much more mainstream in the data center over the next few years. So what is it and how does it work? Um, basically, it's the remote, it stands for remote direct memory access. So it's the remote version of DMA. And DMA is uh, how you can move data inside of a computer. It's the local version, how you can move data inside a computer without sitting in a software loop and moving in a word at a time. So instead, there's a hardware engine in the CPU that you give it a pointer to memory here, give it a pointer to memory here, kick it off, or give it a counter, and it moves the data without the CPU being involved. This is the remote version. So what happens is you tell the RNIC, the adapter that supports RDMA, um, the memory location local, the memory location remotely, the counter, and it moves the data without any interaction of the CPU. That's different than how normal traffic goes through a TCP IP stack because there the CPU is involved and the CPU is controlling the transport layer, which is the layer that takes care of making sure the data gets there, recovering from errors, those sort of things. That's all handled in the hardware of the RNIC. So that's where you get very, very low performance and high bandwidth. And you get also your CPU cycles back, which, like we said earlier, Ceph likes to use. Um, an example of that, oh, actually one more thing on, on RDMA over Ethernet. So initially, RDMA over Ethernet, when it was in those niches, um, it required uh, in the earlier implementations uh, technology that came from fiber channel over Ethernet called PFC or priority flow control to be implemented on the switches. And that gave it the flow control it needed to keep it from overloading the network because it provides so much data. Now that, um, you can use, still use that with RDMA uh, over Ethernet and it, it does improve the performance, but it takes some, some, you know, it takes more effort because you have to configure the switches. Now, later, question? Okay, now um, as that transport layer has been um, improved and no change to the protocol, so it's not a change in the Rocky protocol, it's just an implement, better implementation of the embedded transport layer on the adapters, that um, need for um, priority flow control has gone away. And so, you're, and, and so now you do no longer have to have special settings on your network to run uh, RDMA uh, over Ethernet. Go ahead. <clears throat> This is the diagram I was looking at, and uh, looks like the RDMA does not need any kernel, does not involve kernel at all, or the application is directly talking with hardware, or I'm just trying to understand this picture yes. a little bit better. Yep. So, so the user memory needs to be pinned for the hardware to access it, right? So who's taking care of all that? Uh, uh, so there's, there is a software interface, an API um, driver for the RNIC that has commands to, to take care of those issues. Okay, so, so the API is a kernel API for RD, RDMA? Or? Yes. Okay. Yep. So the kernel is still involved then? Uh, true. Okay. But the picture doesn't show, that's so a little confused. Okay. Yeah, it's a simplified picture. 
Okay. Um, so looking at what you can see from doing RDMA, this is the Microsoft SMB Direct, and basically they, you can double the performance of SMB by using RDMA. Um, you can look at a demonstration on uh, YouTube that they did at the Microsoft, um, I think their conference is called uh, Ignite. So at the Ignite conference uh, a couple years ago, because this technology has been out for a while, they did a demonstration, a live demonstration, which is you can look at with this YouTube, um, on this YouTube uh, site or video. And what they did was live turned on and off TCP IP and, and RDMA. So they switched back and forth. And basically when they did that, the performance or you know, the bandwidth that I showed before, of course, was doubled. But the latency also halved when you went to RDMA and the CPU utilization dropped by over 30%. So this is using software-defined, a software-defined storage application like Ceph with RDMA that's in production today. So if we look at RDMA over Ceph, um, this has been an ongoing project with, for with multiple companies involved. Um, my, our company, a uh, company in China called XSky, Samsung, SanDisk, Red Hat have been contributing to this effort. It was first released in beta in the Hammer release uh, back um, in June, almost two years ago now. Um, it provides RDMA on both the, pro or a version on both the public and the cluster side. And it did have high performance, and I'll show you some of the numbers in a minute, but it did have limited scalability. A lot of it had to do with the memory requirements that you brought up a minute ago. And I'll address that in a second. Um, but. Uh, and now recently there have been lots of updates. They're being pushed upstream in the community constantly, and the focus has been on increasing the scale and the performance, and also we, we, we've implemented a version that no longer re requires pinning of the memory. So <clears throat> one interesting thing about RDMA is that you have these memory locations on two different sites across the network. Well, you have to pin down that memory, and you set up memory um, pieces of memory for all the different connections you have. And what was implemented recently was a way to do that dynamically so that it, you don't have to pin all that memory. You just pin, the parts that are needed are pinned and the rest, um, it's a dynamic um, pinning basically mechanism. Question? Yeah, so does, does, the, uh, does this have to require a single layer to uh, network across all the whole Ceph cluster? Or no. How does it work so when there's a, you know, a routing step? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, a, that's another good question, a very good question. Um, I didn't go into the history of Rocky, um, but there's two different versions of Rocky. Rocky V1, which has initially came out many years ago, and Rocky V2, which came out about four or five years ago. The difference is that Rocky V1, which is kind of obsolete now, not, I mean, it's not used very much. Most, uh, most everybody uses Rocky 2 now. And the difference is Rocky 1 was uh, layer, layer 2, and Rocky V2 has an IP UP, UDP layer, so it's routable. Thank you for the question. Good question. Um, so you can go to the Mellanox community pages, and it walks you through how to configure Ceph uh, to use RDMA. And here's some of the performance numbers for that. Um, so we saw, uh, we measured it in two different ways. One, just raw performance, the same setup, and the other to see the CPU savings. So we could save multiple cores um, on both the client and the OSD uh, and still get 44% more performance. And if we had the same number of cores used on both sides, we could get almost 60% in performance improvement. Like most things with Ceph, depending on the load, the workload, you get different, different um, performance. And in this case, which is where we've seen the best performance, where you've got a high IOPS workload with small block sizes, and here we could see um, performance improvements of up to 3x using RDMA with very low latency. Um, so to kind of prove to everybody that this isn't uh, just slideware, um, we have uh, lots of customers around the world in multiple different industries, um, you know, from financial to, to cloud uh, to um, education and more. And um, 
if you want to know more about uh, using our products with Ceph, um, we have a booth over in the marketplace. And I'm also um, open to answering some questions. To kind of summarize, the benefits um, you know, to improve Ceph, one thing to make sure you do is use faster networks. 10 gigabit is not enough. And especially if you've got more than 15 hard drives or you're using SSDs. Uh, SSDs just require, or SSDs will give you higher performance, but make sure you improve the network as well. Um, and having a, high, a separate cluster network is a, a, a way to get better reliability in your system and to improve the performance. And then if you want to go even further into the turbo area of performance, um, you can look at uh, RDMA uh, for Ceph. Any questions? So it's uh, my understanding right now that RDMA and Ceph is still kind of upstream development. Is that correct? Or is it fully supported in any of the, the uh, you know, GA versions of Ceph? It is not fully supported in any of the GA versions today. Um, any idea when that will happen? Um, I think we are hoping to have that happen, uh, you know, later this year or early next year. Cool. And then uh, the other question was about PFC in Rocky. Um, uh -huh. Is there a specific adapter uh, that no longer requires PFC, like uh, ConnectX4, ConnectX5, or is that just kind of universal across all the adapters at this point? So if you take our, our adapter product line, um, just to give a little background for, uh, you obviously know it well, but ConnectX3 is probably, the, was our 10 40 gig product that came out um, probably four-ish years ago. ConnectX4 was the 10, 25, 40, 50, 100 gig product that recently came out. And then ConnectX5 is the product that just came out. Um, each one of those products has a faster ability to recover from problems it, that it sees in the network. All of them will recover, but more and more of that transport layer has been improved in the hardware of the adapters going forward. So um, ConnectX4 can definitely uh, do it in a, in, a, in a rocky environment using, in not using PFC. You need to use an, an implement, uh, a function called um, ECN, or Extended um, Notification of Congestion, I think it stands for. Uh, and then ConnectX5, um, you don't need anything. But one thing to keep in mind, if you're trying to get super high performance like we're talking about here, you can't just run it on a 10 gig network in the middle. You have to either over provision or implement some type of congestion management in order to get the performance, you know, the highest performance levels. And nothing comes for free. But it, but it does work, you just lose performance. Yeah, uh, very good work. I have a couple, couple of questions. Yeah. So first thing is, I didn't see IP of, over IB numbers, right? Did you compare with that scheme? I mean, RDMA um, with that? Yeah, so you can definitely run this with InfiniBand. There's really no difference in the API interface. Yes. And you'll see faster performance with InfiniBand, depending on the wire speed, because InfiniBand has lower latency. Yeah, um, my question is, compare with RDMA solution, compare RDMA solution with the default one running over IP of IB. How much benefit do you see? Uh, if how much can... difference between yes. InfiniBand versus IP? No, how much difference between RDMA and IP over IB? IP over IB. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Okay, so you're just running IP on it. You know, I don't, there may be some numbers that, okay. for that, but I don't have them. Let me, I suggest you stop by the booth, though, over okay. in the marketplace, because um, there's a marketing guy there named uh, John Kim who has organized a lot of the testing, and he would know if we've tested that. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is you mentioned about the uh, memory consumption. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, do you support like UD or DCT rather than just RC? Do, 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 do you have any ideas? Yeah. Um, it's, it has to be the, the RC. Uh, so I'm not a super InfiniBand expert. I come f I'm, my focus is on the storage. Um, okay. But I have done it in the past. So the, the dedicated or the, the type of connection over InfiniBand where you have, or over R RDMA in general, where you know that, the, that, you, that your, your message has been sent and guaranteed, it, you, it does that. Um, that's, 
and it also handles the just plain messaging rate, the UDP part of it. So this, is new, this new dynamically allocation works across all the different types of, of RDMA. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, question regarding the ConnectX uh, uh, evasion coding support. Uh -huh. uh, what kind of throughput uh, performance improvement can you expect uh, using these type of adapters versus uh, doing it in CPU? So the ConnectX 5, as I said earlier, is the one that supports that, and it's just come out, and we haven't released any performance numbers on it yet. So I guess um, I probably can't tell you um, in a public uh, forum. If you want to stop by the booth this afternoon, we can discuss it more. Sorry about that. It's, it's good. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I think probably a lot of people are still running file store based Ceph clusters, but with the change to Blue Store and the sort of the, not the necessarily the need for a separate journal, um, there's obviously performance implications to that. How do you see that feeding into this also dramatic uh, increase in the capability of IO from these additional devices? That so I'm not 100%. Versed on the differences in the load on the network, but if the load on the network um, is the same, meaning that you're you're not reducing the amount of data that's moving across the network with this change, you should see no difference. Anything else? Great. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs>